Hey y'all, it's Mr. Reardon, broadcasting live from my fortress of, fortress of solitude on a sunny day in Birmingham. I hope you guys have had a nice three days off. I myself am getting a little bored, and to be perfectly honest, I'm getting a little antsy about uh, our lack of contact and, and the fact that we've got IB exams in May, and even more importantly, perhaps for you, you have an exam in about four days on molecular genetics. All that stuff on molecular genetics, DNA replication, transcription, translation, you've seen it, you've had it, we've talked about it in class, you've had access to the resources for several, it seems like several weeks now, so there's no excuse not to be successful on that exam. The last little bit of new material I do want to go ahead and deliver online, and this is a, just a super brief overview of how my, microorganisms can increase their genetic variability. And what we're going to talk about over the course of the next 10 minutes is essentially four main ways which bacteria can, can move genes around. One of which is uh, plasmids. We already know about plasmids from our PGLO lab. But then we'll also talk briefly about transduction. That's essentially where uh, bacteria use viruses to move genes around. Or a better way to think about it would be viruses accidentally move genes, uh, bacterial genes around. We're going to talk about uh, conjugation. Uh, that is basically bacterial sex, for lack of a better term. And then I want to talk about transposition, uh, jumping genes, and then relate transposition back to plasmids, and then relate transposition to plasmids back to conjugation. So there's sort of the whole thing essentially ties together. We should end up talking about uh, multi-drug resistant bacteria. Some interesting stuff there. Uh, but before we get too deep into it, I do want to start with what we know, and that is we already know a lot about plasma. So just going back quickly, 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 here is an image of a plasma. This is our PGLO plasma, and when we, when we insert that circular piece of DNA into cells uh, and, and put those cells in the right environment, they will express the genes uh, that are contained on this plasma. And here on the right, we see transform bacteria that are have the ability to grow in the presence of ampicillin. Therefore, they are expressing this BLA or beta-lactamase gene. And we also see that they are glowing green. Therefore, they are expressing this green fluorescent protein. And if you watched the last talk on operons, you know that this ARAC gene codes for a regulatory protein, which is then, this regulatory protein is then induced uh, by arabinose, the sugar contained in this plate. And once induced, that opens up uh, the expression of GFP. And if you haven't seen that, you need to go back and watch that video. It is embedded on our blog, and it's also on YouTube. You search for operons. But, and we'll come back to this plate. This is a really interesting little uh, example, what's going on here. And you've seen it. You know it. You love it. You can't live without it. But uh, I will keep it in your purview. Now, and again, before looking at transduction and some of these other ways which bacteria can move genes around, I do want to spend just a second on uh, E. coli genetics, basic, basic, basic E. coli genetics. Why E. coli? Well, E. coli are essentially the lab rat of molecular biology. We completely sequence the genes. We know where the genes are. We know what those genes code for. We know what the expression of those genes looks like. But here's a nice example of E. coli with its one chromosome all looped up inside the cytosol. Uh, worth noting that that chromosome is roughly uh, 4.3 million base pairs long about 4,400 genes. And what's interesting to note is that chromosome itself is roughly 500 times longer than a bacterial cell. And this image here that I'm circling around is a classic image of a lysed bacterial cell or lysed E. coli with its one chromosome sort of spilling out like spaghetti. It's really it's a gorgeous image. Uh, interesting stuff about how that chromosome is actually packed up, but that's uh, beyond the scope of our course. And then before we leave the slide, it's nice to see a plasmid in its native state. We always show them as circles, but truth be told, uh, plasmids look sort of like limp rope that are all looped up together. And that's actually, if you think about it, that sort of narrowness and the fact that it's kind of twisted up like that probably makes it easier to transform bacteria. It's probably easier to take up a little skinny rope like this and would be a, a fat circle of DNA. But worth noting that... Uh, a uh, bacterial genome, E. coli's genome, is roughly 100 times larger than a viral genome. And look at this, roughly 1,000 times smaller than uh, even the most simple eukaryotic genome. And again, I've said it once, I'll say it twice. 
these guys reproduce asexually. That is, this one chromosome is replicated at the origin of replication, and then all those genes are copied, hopefully with very high fidelity, and through binary fission, the two daughter cells look just like the uh, parent cell. Now, it is worth noting that these during that replication, mutations happen. You get a substitution, you could get a deletion or an insertion, but quite often you get a, you get a substitution, an A to a T, a G to a C. And I do want you guys to know that the number one way that bacteria's, bacterial genomes change is through random mutation. So, and if you think about it, if an E. coli like this in an optimal environment can double every 20 minutes, if you get a mutation every roughly one million base pairs, well, that's probably four mutations per cell. Now, like we learned last week, most of those mutations are nothing. They're probably silent. Uh, some of them could be nonsense. Some of them would be harmful. However, if that mutation leads to a change in a protein and that allows for greater efficiency of bacterial growth, then that mutation will permeate in an environment, and that's happening all the time. So again, I do want you to know that mutation is the number one way in which uh, bacterial genomes change, but there are other methods as well where you get sort of less gradual change in bacterial genomes and get things happening faster. The first of which, of course, is uh, uh, transformation with a plasmid. A bacteria, like these E. coli right here, take up a naked piece of DNA and then uh, have the ability to translate, transcribe and translate those genes, and then they essentially have extra genes. And I've jumped up and down about this a lot. Those new genes are not integrated into the host cell's genome. They're really like uh, hand luggage, or again, to use the silly, the kind of more modern analogy, they're like apps on a phone, right? So I don't want to whip out my computer all the time, but it's nice to have my phone because it can do a lot of the things that my computer can. So the, the phone is similar to, the phone is like the plasmid and the computer itself is like the native genome of the cell. And then the individual genes on the plasmid are like apps on the phone. Uh, and again, with a plasmid, you can get usually about 4,000 up to maybe 8,000 base pairs. That could be anywhere from two to six genes uh, per plasmid. If you want to move a bigger package of DNA, you need to do something called transduction. And this is transduction. And here the thing you need to remember is that with transduction, the virus is the vector. When we did transformation with our pigloplasmid, there was nothing housing the DNA. It was just naked. It was free in the environment. Here we see a phage. That is a virus which has the ability to inject DNA into a E. coli cell, that's the vector. And up top, what we're looking at here, I'll blow this up a little bit if I, if I can. Yeah. Here we see it's kind of the normal action. So the pink and manila thing is our bacterial host cell, and here's the phage in purple. It's sticking its DNA into the host cell. And then what's going to happen is that's going to lyse. <coughs> that's essentially going to, when that insertion of DNA occurs, that's going to break down the bacterial genome. Uh, and then the bacteria essentially taken hostage, if you will, and turned away from being a bacteria and turned into a virus DNA replicating machine. And here we can see one, two, three, three different proteins, viral proteins being made. And then ideally for the bacteria, for the virus anyway, uh, you get new protein capsids, you get new viral DNA, all that stuff is packaged up and then the donor cell or host cell splits into pieces and new viruses escape. Well, what we're looking at here is one of these protein capsules didn't pick up viral DNA, but look, it picked up host cell DNA, this A plus gene. So that's bacterial DNA in brown. And then this phage doing what it does, goes and infects another cell. And we notice that this cell has has the same genes, but different, if you will, different alleles, different variants of these genes, A minus instead of A plus. Well, because these two pieces of DNA are homologous, when that uh, recipient cell goes to replicate, this A plus gene could be crossed over, recombined with the host cell's genome. And so here what we've got is a recombinant cell. It's not A, it's not A minus B plus, A plus B plus like this guy. It's not A minus B minus like this guy, but it's something new. It's A plus B minus. So we have a new genotype and potentially a new phenotype. And again, that's happening all the time. 
because bacteria are constantly under a viral attack, specifically here from these phages. So again, that's a lot of talk, but the thing you want to remember is that transduction happens. It's a way to move more DNA between bacterial cells and just transformation alone. Pretty interesting stuff. And you, of course, you can read about that in your text. Uh, and I want you to read about that in your text. What's interesting, it's back to plasmids, and here's uh, conjugation, and I describe that as a bacterial sex. And essentially, just to kind of make this a little bit more interesting, I thought I'd play some Al Green. Hopefully that'll come up. Love and happiness. Oh, there's love and happiness. I wanted, uh, I wanted Let's Stay Together, a better song. So here, what I want you to imagine, my friends, is a bacterial cell that has a plasmid. And that host, that bacteria with the plasmid can send out what's called a mating bridge. That's the PG version. The PG-13 version is called a sex pill. It's essentially a hair that connects with another cell. So here we have bacterial cell one, bacterial cell two. This guy's got a plasmid. And then once it connects with another cell, once it conjugates, that plasmid is replicated and then passed across the sex pillars to a new cell. And what we end up having are the sex pillars is going to break, and now we've got two cells that contain the plasmid. That relates quite a bit to our bacterial experiment. So if we look closely at these plates, let me back up just a little bit. Here, just going to follow my crosshairs. Here we've got a lot of transformed cells. Here we can just we can see two cells just coming together. Those cells in that colony have the ability to cross bridge, form these sex pili, and actually transfer plasmids from one to another. It wouldn't be a big deal here because all these cells are transformed. But think about it over here, perhaps. If you look closely here, I'll try and get as close as I can without losing that uh, resolution. Here, right under the crosshairs, a transformed cell. But remember, when those cells send out beta-lactamase or secrete beta-lactamase, they break down ampicillin, and we can see one, two, three, and four different non-transformed cells close to that original colony. Well, here's the deal. If this colony continues to grow, and it could if we left it in the incubator, and if these two colonies continue to grow, which they could if we left them in the incubator, and you got physical contact between the cells on the edge of this colony and these cells on the edge of these two colonies, you could totally get conjugation and you could get transforma transformation or, excuse me, uh, a passage of the plasmid from the transformed cells to these non-transformed cells. In a sense, these cells would become antibiotic resistant and then also potentially express GFP. Very cool stuff. And again, that's happening all the time. That's why we want to get individual colonies when we pick, pick uh, colonies off a bacterial plate because we want to make sure that they are uh, non-transformed and genetically identical. If two cells meet like ships passing in the night, well, we don't know if they're genetically identical or not. One could pick up a plasma for another, from another. And what's really interesting, very similar to our lab, is that if this plasmid contains an antibiotic resistance gene, with what your book refers to as an R cell, one R cell can generate or create, I don't like the word create, but conjugate with and generate two R cells. And then what happens? Those two R cells conjugate with two other cells. You've got four, and then you've got eight, and then you've got 16 and 32, etc. So you, what you can see is a, is a passage of these antibiotic resistance genes through conjugation. Pretty interesting stuff. And again, that's going to be sort of the back end message uh, later today or later when we finish this talk. Moving on, you guys. Uh, transposition. This is pretty interesting. What I'm talking about here is our jumping genes. So transposition is essentially copy and paste. Uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes have the ability to move genes around within their genomes. And what's really interesting is once a gene is copied and replicated and pasted somewhere else, both those genes sort of go down their own lines of mutation. They will both randomly mutate it independently of each other. So you can actually have little families of genes and subpopulations of genes within a genome. And we'll talk about that quite a bit when we get into our evolution unit. But briefly here, 
Transposition, again, is when one gene gets copied and then pasted into another place in the genome. And that happens because of these inverted repeats of ATCC GTT on either side of an insertion sequence. And then in the middle of those inverted repeats is a gene called transposase, an enzyme which has the ability to jump around the genome. Okay, now you're probably going, well, big deal, why does this matter? Here's why it matters. Imagine we've got this construct, right? We've got these repeats, and we've got transposase. But now, imagine that inside the insertion sequence, now we have two of them. Between those is an antibiotic resistance gene, like beta-lactamase. Now beta-lactamase, or any other antibiotic resistance gene, has the ability to be replicated, uh, or duplicated, and then patched in somewhere else in the genome. Now you're probably thinking, big deal, it's already got the gene, why does it need another? But, but wait, there's more. What if this antibiotic resistance gene was not pasted, duplicated and pasted back into the host cell genome, but duplicated and pasted onto a plasmid? What happens is bacteria have the ability to jump these antibiotic resistance genes from the host cell to a plasmid, and not once, but here we see it five different times. So in this image, there's been the transposition of ampicillin resistance, canamycin resistance, streptocyclin resistance, or streptomycin resistance, amoxicillin resistance, and chloramphenicol resistance. These are one, two, three, four, five different antibiotic resistance genes, all transposed to a single plasmid. It's like an all-access pass, right? It's, it's the phone with all the apps you'd ever need to get anywhere. And here, when you think back about transposition or conjugation, imagine an F plus cell with a multi-drug resistant plasmid passing that around. And we see that in not just in Reardon's kind of silly ideas, but actually in real life. For instance, here is MRSA or methacycline resistant staphylococcus aureus, or staph infection, multi-drug resistant staph infection. We know that staphylococcus or staph is the type of bacteria that easily takes plasmids up from the environment. And if these bacteria take up plasmids with multi-drug resistance, they have the ability to really withstand antibiotics. And what's interesting about this MRSA is that it, 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 is, it is essentially immune to all the, the whole family of penicillins, methicillin, doxicillin, nafcillin, and oxicillin, uh, and even cephalosporin. So really, all your major guns for knocking this bacterium out are useless because these bacteria have the genes to resist that, those drugs, and they have the ability to pass that around as soon as they come together. Really interesting stuff. Makes for major problems in hospitals. It makes for real problems in terms of drug design as well. Uh, and again, that has everything to do with sort of the basics of microbial genetics. And again, things that you need to recognize when you're to take an exam from me or an AP or an IB exam is to know the ways in which bacteria can change their genomes. Mutation, transformation clearly, transduction, and then conjugation uh, and plasmids. Hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. You guys got to study, study, study for that test coming up this week.